Good morning. My name is Eleni Elliott. I'm a paralegal in the Civil and Community Rights Unit at the Rhode Island Attorney General's Office. It's my honor to introduce our first distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Marissa Houtman. Dr. Houtman is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital, where each week she provides multidisciplinary care to children impacted by lead poisoning, asthma, and other diseases caused by environmental exposures. Dr. Houtman earned her undergraduate and graduate degree in social and environmental epidemiology at Brown University and her medical degree from NYU. While a graduate student at Brown, she served as a commissioner of the Rhode Island Attorney General's Advisory Commission on Lead Paint and was awarded the 2007 Rhode Island Healthy Housing Award by the Rhode Island Department of Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Houtman. Um, thank you, everyone. It's a true honor and privilege to be here. Um, and today I'll be talking about Road to Resilience, Protecting Our Children's Future Through Lead Poisoning Prevention. Um, I have not, no conflicts of interest to disclose, but um, I wouldn't be here today without the support of our funders. So from, um, I'm the co-director for the New England Region 1 Pediatric Environmental Special Unit, which is supported by the AAP and the CDC ATSDR, as well as the US EPA. I also um, have an NIH and IHS Career Development Award, and most recently, I'm making the medical advisor for the Bureau of Climate and Environmental Health at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and all of this helps me to continue to um, protect our children from hazards in their environment. Um, but I do not officially represent any of these wonderful agencies, um, nor if I inadvertently share any commercial products, they do not endorse them. Um, so I don't often do this, but I like to take a minute just to dedicate this talk to the children and families impacted by lead-based paint hazards or other lead exposure, um, and as, as well as the families that have been tireless champions um, in preventing lead poisoning for future generations. And many of the champions in this room in Rhode Island and neighboring states, advocacy groups, Senator Reed, Child, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, and others um, that um, inspire hope and, and um, in this prevention efforts. And lastly, um, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and um, especially here in Rhode Island, for me, this I'd like to dedicate this talk to Dr. Patrick Vivier, who um, at the ripe old age of 22, when I was 22, I became a graduate student at Brown under Patrick Vivier's mentorship um, at the same time that Rhode Island was suing the lead paint companies. And I always knew I wanted to become a pediatrician, but I never knew how much of our children's health can be prevented before they even reach the hospital. Um, and Dr. Rivera inspired that in me and changed my career trajectory. And so, and he's now back as Dean of University of Rhode Island as of January. Um, I'm not sure if he's here yet. Um, so today I'll talk to you a little bit about an introduction to childhood lead poisoning, a little bit about the evidence um, and why it's still such a relevant issue today in this changing planet, um, as well as a little bit of my lived experience in Rhode Island and why I still have so much hope um, that, that we can prevent um, these exposures for future generations. So as Senator Reid said, um, today there's 24 million housing units across the United States that still have lead-based pain hazards, of which four million are home to young children. The new Northeast is particularly um, impacted due to our old housing stock. Um, this is from an infographic that Kamala Harris released and showed that more than 50% of kids in the U.S. are at risk of lead exposure. And this statistic was derived from a paper that we had recently published um, that leveraged a national clinical laboratory data set from across the United States to look at the ubiquitous lead exposure that our children still face today. As I mentioned, there are many sources of lead, and they aren't all equal. Um, there's legacy source of lead that persists in our environment from lead-based paint and soil contamination, water pipes that have um, gained increasing attention after the Flint water crisis, um, as well as a myriad of other sources from imported cookware and Ayurvedic medicine, um, and it feels like each week there's a new news cycle about um, other um, food products or uh, products that have been contaminated. But I'd like to highlight that still 80% of sources of lead exposure for our children are from legacy sources of lead-based paint or gasoline. So um, I think for the purpose of this talk, I will focus on those sources because I think that's where we 
this is certainly a very preventable issue. So as a pediatrician and mother, I know all too well about the vulnerability of children to environmental exposures. Some of the reasons of this are very normal, developmentally appropriate. Children at young ages, at one and two, explore their environment through their mouth, as evidenced by my little daughter giving this library <laughs> duck a kiss. Um, and um, because of their need to grow, absorb more um, lead from their GI tract than than um, an adult. So in comparison, a child will absorb 70% of lead that is, passes through their GI tract compared to 20% in an adult. They have a porous blood-brain barrier, so any toxins that are in their bloodstream readily cross the, the blood-brain barrier, and that's why particularly the focus is on children less than six when the blood-brain barrier is particularly porous. Um, and their developing organs are at more risk of injury from their developing brain, as well as their immature detoxification systems. Not all children um, are, are similarly exposed to um, environmental hazards. And, and in our environmental health clinic, we frequently see children with developmental um, delays or autism spectrum disorders that cause the pica to persist far into um, later years of childhood. So some of the evidence of why you hear all, all over the media, there's no safe lead level. So this is a study um, that pooled seven different studies um, that was done by Bruce Lanfear and environmental health perspectives that really demonstrated that there's no safe lead level. So although the dose and the duration of lead exposure matter, what, what the study showed is that um, for each 10 unit increase in lead levels, there's an a uh, similar, there's an increasing detriment in the lower part of the curve. So if um, blood lead level is on the x-axis and IQ is on the y, the vertical, um, if a child goes from a lead level of 0 to 10, they'll have a 3.9 detriment in IQ points, 10 to 20, 1.9, 20 to 30, 1.1. So still a child that has levels in the 30s, 40s, 50s will have the most impact um, from an IQ perspective. But as you can see, the steepest part of the curve is this is this flat part. I mean, it's this zero to ten part. And so, we we aren't able through many 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 studies that have been done and replicated to identify a safe window where we can say below three point five is fine or below five is fine. Um, and there's been tons of studies that sort of continue to de demonstrate this dose response impact. This is one from Rhode Island by Patricia McLean um, that was published that divided um, the, the registry of childhood blood levels in Rhode Island by deciles, um, and then it related it to the um, school achievement rates um, that are done each fall, and found this pretty impressive dose-response relationship. They adjusted for all the things that were readily available, the data set, age at start of kindergarten, gender, year, um, race and ethnicity of the child, child's primary language, and free and reduced blood status, and this is the, still the curve that um, resulted. This is work done by Bruce Lampier as well um, that shows why, why it matters if a child has a 3.9 or a 5 decrement in IQ. Um, and um, he has a nonprofit that's called Little Things Matter, um, and I think it does a really nice job of um, of relaying why on an individual level we may not be able to predict the impact of um, lead exposure, but on a population level, we certainly can say that these, these decrements in IQ matter. So if this is the distribution of IQ scores in US children, um, where a certain percentage are below, have an IQ below 85 and require special edu education costs, and a certain percentage are gifted and needed to solve all the world problems, um, with a decrement in IQ, you're going to shift um, those individuals that need special education upwards of 3.4 million, and similarly decrease those that are classified as gifted and can help us all solve climate crisis and every other problem we face. Um, it, on a weekly basis, um, and maybe a daily basis, I talk to families about the lead exposure that their children face. And I think it's important to highlight that we're not able to predict um, the impact of lead exposure for any one individual child. And there are things that we can relate to families that may um, 
empower them and give them hope. One is the dose and the duration matters. So the whole um, rationale of why we test little children for lead is because we hope that by identifying lead in our children and via our housing stock, we can intervene and we can reduce the lead exposures that they face um, and shorten that duration as well as the dose of lead exposure. So although there's no safe lead level, we know that the lower levels are associated with developmental toxicity, it's been discussed already. Um, and then the higher elevated lead levels are related to more acute symptoms at the time of the exposure. So anemia, gastrointestinal effects, disturbances of calcium and vitamin D metabolism, and even encephalopathy. So um, just this week, we have two current patients at Boston Children's Hospital from all over the region um, with um, severe lead poisoning requiring inpatient chelation therapy um, with anemia, um, lead colic, constipation, encephalopathy, seizures, coma, and even death at high, high levels. So um, my memory of my time here was really filled with hope. Um, and I'd like to sort of bring us back to that era um, and maybe we can empower ourselves to, to, to really prevent future generations from exposure. So as many in this room remember, um, in the 1990s, Rhode Island was the first state in the nation to take on the lead paint industry. Um, first started by uh, Attorney General then and now Senator Sheldon Whitehouse um, and followed by Patrick Lynch. Um, and um, this is a historic event, and as a result of the first trial, DuPont donated $12.5 million to the state of Rhode Island to mitigate lead hazards, set up educational supports, um, as well as set up that Rhode Island Attorney General that commission that I was, it was an honor to serve on. Um, and a small amount of that funding went to Brown and my mentor Patrick Bibier and supported my graduate research assistantship. So my master's degree was, <coughs> entirely spent two years thinking and trying to um, provide the data and the analytics to support this primary prevention program that was designed as a result of the um, DuPont do donation. Um, and it was filled with a lot of hope because um, at the time, the Rhode Island Attorney General was retrying the other lead paint companies. Um, and we were charged with developing a program that could mitigate lead hazards in homes, and well as a replicable program that may be able to be implemented if billions followed, which we are all hopeful they would. So we set up a study to evaluate the geographic distribution of lead poisoning in Rhode Island, and to use the spatial analysis to identify high-risk areas to target for primary prevention of lead poisoning. And for this, Dr. Rivier and myself won this Rhode Island Healthy Housing Award. And I, as a master's student and very eager, and um, I set out to learn how to do all this mapping and GIS and how to sort of leverage this data to, to make um, evidence-based decisions. So we included 12 years of data from the Rhode Island Department of Health, um, from the um, Child Lead Poisoning Prevention Program and the registry, um, and we took the highest blood level per child during the study period. We looked at area-based measures, um, lead poisoning by census block group, which is around like 1,000, individuals in a neighborhood, as can be seen on this map. We looked at old housing um, as high-risk areas, as well as children under six, so that we'd be designing a program that could be um, most impactful, and areas where the population living in low poverty threshold um, was highest. So we um, took the lead poisoning data, we, um, not surprising to anyone in this room, but um, it was included 204,000 individuals, and 88% of the highest quintiles of lead poisoning came from these five municipalities in the core cities that are talked about in Rhode Island as well as Newport. Um, and although this is 88% of the highest quintiles of lead poisoning, it only represents 36% of the block groups in the state. Um, and what we found, which was super helpful in designing a primary prevention, is that the distribution of lead poisoning wasn't random. There was block groups of high lead poisoning, neighboring high lead poisoning, and block groups that were sort of more cool spots and, and less impacted. Um, and so when we looked at sort of the impact of poverty and old housing, we found that in this first column that um, those children that lived in the highest quintile um, for poverty um, had a, close to four times the odds of having being lead poisoned. At that time, it was defined as 10 and up. And same with old housing, close to three times the odds. We then adjusted for 
Um, and it, the first column adjusts for all the race ethnicity and um, age and method of testing that is available from the public data source. Um, and then the, the far right column adjusts for spatial neighborhood factors. And so we took the highest quintile in each of these um, block groups, and um, if a block group fell in the highest quintile for each of these factors, they were presented to this Attorney General Commission and assessed for um, feasibility and um, offered um, the housing units in those areas to, to have lead hazard mitigation. So what I learned was that the burden of lead poisoning was not evenly distributed. The targeted lead poisoning prevention could successfully be implemented in identified block groups and be replicated as further funding was available. And um, after the study, I went on to medical school in New York and really took with me and has followed the rest of my career the powerful impact of where a child lives on their health and the ability to mitigate disease and improve health outside of the hospital walls simply by addressing a child's environment. We continued this work and um, this led to this national study um, where we found similar findings, not surprisingly. Um, so this was a study that had 1.1 million children from 2018 through 2020 and more than 50% of the children tested had detectable blood lead levels. Um, and we found the same trends with um, public insurance um, being related to elevated lead levels as well as um, old housing by a neighborhood level as in poverty. In Boston now, we've continued this work to really understand how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted lead testing. Um, many of the state health departments um, have really highlighted that um, just like immunization rates and other things, um, We've, we've dropped in terms of screening and testing um, and are now feeling the rebound. And so what we found was children living in older housing, as well as um, those of minoritized populations, had higher risks of lead poisoning after the pandemic compared to before. Um, and lastly, we continue this work looking at the trends in Rhode Island. And although the, the lead levels are dropping, um, the the disparities persist and the injustices persist. Um, so here's my ideas of how we can sort of work together to protect our children's future. Um, and especially I think um, all the lessons we've learned from the lead poisoning issue, all the advocacy successes that we've had over the last five decades, I think are increasingly lessons that we can apply to other environmental hazards as well as um, to addressing the climate crisis. So I think it's still paramount and important to, to implement secondary testing um, until we're able to rebuild our whole housing stock. Um, I think this is critical to be able to identify and intervene um, for a child without symptoms so that we mitigate long-term health impact. Um, this is, I, when I teach residents and trainees in medicine, I always say there's not, nothing else in medicine that the lead level, that the what is considered normal or safe has shifted over time. So in the 1960s, the CDC um, noted anyone above less than 60 for a blood level was considered safe. They didn't have these acute symptoms, they were fine. And then over time, in the 1970s, we learned that actually there's these long-term sequelae of lead. And then um, with each decade and each myriad of studies, um, in the 2005s, we learned that there's no safe lead level. Um, and so now the CDC no longer defines a le a, an elevated lead level as um, a detectable lead level as safe, um, but rather sort of defines it based on the reference level, um, the 97th and a half percentile of the population in the prior NHANES or sort of the surveillance system. Um, and these levels now, as of 2021, are recommended to public health action if the level is above 3.5. But I think clinically, I would argue that any detectable lead level is relevant and should be um, further addressed in terms of where it may be coming from. Lead management, I think, um, is more than medicine. It's really a multidisciplinary team effort. Um, and I think that's what makes it so inspiring. It's all, it's all these different key stakeholders from legal to housing advocates to public health agencies. Um, as well as clinicians coming together to really help families, um, early intervention and educators as well. Um, so on the left is, um, sorry, on your right is um, 
is all the sort of more clinical things that we can do so we can test um, if need be we can give chelation therapy but that's at much 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 higher levels and um, there's been a recent study by Jennifer Stingone and all um, in Michigan that um, or sorry in Chicago that um, really highlights the importance of early intervention so if you take nothing else away if you have a child that um, has an elevated level and you plug them into early intervention or advocate for a universal preschool or anything, um, you are doing that little child a lot of good. Um, and nutrition is also impactful in terms of how much the, the child absorbs from their environment. And these on the left, I'm sorry, on the right are all the things that many of you in this room do um, and do so well. So um, conducting lead inspections, being detectives to figure out is it the housing, is it aromatic medicine, is it imported cookware, is it um, the water, um, all of these things are so important to find out where the lead is coming from and intervene. I think housing advocacy to, um, especially in the Northeast where we have such a limited housing supply, um, really advocating for this healthy housing approach. And then working together to really, to really continue this effort for lead as well as the thousands of other environmental chemicals that we don't know as much about um, and to, create resiliency in this climate crisis. Um, these are some of the things we all think about. Um, but um, really, primary prevention of lead exposure is key. And for that, we all need to come together. Um, I think I wanted to highlight this article by Michelle Rogers and Patrick Vivier, and um, that really looked um, at the impact of the policy. So Rhode Island has been um, very proactive in passing legislation and um, to, to enforce um, that, that homes are inspected and continuing to be inspected. And um, clinically, this I find incredibly important. Um, so many times families um, don't know the status of their home and are said, oh, it was inspected in 2000, and they still come in with needing hospitalization or high lead levels. Um, and so these laws work and um, although they have a financial sequelae, are um, super important to protect our children's future. Um, lastly, a few more slides just to talk about sort of this healthy housing approach. And I think Ruth Ann Norton um, is an inspiring talk speaker who will mention this as well. But um, I urge each of you, whether you're, when you're interacting with families or in your work, to think not just, don't stay in your lane. Don't just think about the lead exposures in the home, but think about whether this family lives in an urban heat island or are at flood risk or um, has mold intrusion and, and make sure to address all of the housing exposures that our families face. Because for one child, it may be lead exposure in the family, another child may have asthma and really taking this holistic approach is crucial. This is um, a screening tool that um, myself and my partner, Dr. Shali Shah at Boston Children's developed um, that sort of helps give a mnemonic to th things to think about in the home. And, um, lead is here under E for exposures. Um, and I think um, if I had a trillion dollars, I would give it all to these children, to our education systems, to our housing stock, um, and really investing in um, making it easy to mitigate the homes from lead exposures as well as, as, well as other um, environmental chemicals. And just one last slide about where I sit in case um, I can never be helpful to any of your work. So I'm the co-director for the Boston Children's Hospital Pediatric Environmental Health Center, and we're also home to this Pediatric Environmental Health Special Unit, which is a national network, as can be seen on this map. Each administrative region has a hub, and, and we're um, the hub for Rhode Island and New England. Um, I'm also a, a toxicology consultant for the Massachusetts Rhode Island Poison Control Center, so all the high, high, high lead calls that come from Rhode Island come to my pager um, each night. So um, I still think about Rhode Island weekly and um, I'm so honored to be back here. Um, and I think that's it. So in conclusion, childhood lead poisoning and lead exposure um, due to legacy sources is still very much a problem today. Lead poisoning is an environmental justice and civil rights issue. And the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on lead testing and lead exposure. And further policies are needed to prevent the deleterious impact of lead for our children. Thanks.